I ask you to take God's Word and find Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Before I forget, before I forget, before I get into the Word this morning, there's a couple things uh, I didn't mention to you earlier. Uh, we were supposed to have a, a prayer meeting at 6 p.m. out at a Country Way, Country Way uh, last week, Town Center, and we didn't get that done because the storm came through. So they have it tentatively scheduled again tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, looking at the weather, it may rain again. I don't know. I didn't find out till about 25 minutes till... Uh, we were supposed to be there last Sunday that was postponed, so I tried to get on Facebook and post that as quickly as I could. Uh, some of you I had heard that went out there, but you realized that they, we didn't have it last week. So there's supposed to be a prayer meeting at 6 p.m. tonight, so just keep that tentatively scheduled. And know uh, it's storming. The reason they do that, I guess they have microphones and amps out there to help the people leading us in prayer and the radio transmission all that going on, so I guess the storm's kept that from going on last week and may may stop it tonight but it is on schedule today at 6 p.m. this afternoon. I also want to say a word about our Facebook fa fan, uh, family and, and friends that are joining us. We appreciate you being here today. Our first service back since March, one service together. We've been back since May 31st in two services. We've come back together, so we're glad that you've joined us with us. If you couldn't make it with us today uh, he, to be here on campus, we're glad that you've checked in with us today. Uh, so we're going to be in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 7 this morning. I want to preach on this subject today, In Jesus. I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians. We started that a couple weeks ago. I reminded you last week in chapters 1 through 3, uh, uh, Paul declares the wealth of the Christians. We are studying about our treasure trove of spiritual realities and spiritual riches that we have in Jesus. You and I are wealthy as as Jesus can make us. These riches are not ours, though, because of our family, because of our background, because of our upbringing, because of our goodness, or because of our deserving. We don't deserve it. And the Christian's wealth is found in Jesus and because of Jesus. This, uh, these verses in chapter 3, I preached last week on uh, in verses uh, 3 through 6 on election, but 3 through 14, verses 3 through 14 in the Greek is one sentence. That's a long run on sentence in the English, but it's got some deep theology and some great theology in there. And in the next few verses, in the next few weeks, Lord willing, in verse 7 through 14, we're going to be studying this subject about in Jesus. May the Lord Jesus use his word to remind us, encourage us, inspire us, uh, and free us from those things that might hinder us uh, in our faith and in our living. You know, belonging has its benefits. To, to be in the military, military, it has its benefits for those who are service, for those who are in the service. There's responsibilities and duties for every branch of the service for those who are serving in the service. They have responsibilities, but they also have benefits. Uh, on the job, if you work a job for a company, there's benefits for working at that company. You get a regular paycheck, uh, being a productive team member. You have health and retirement benefits. Belonging on a team is a rare and special privilege for players. The team works together, practices together, travels together, wins or loses together. Championships, accolades, awards, fan bases all come to those who are on the team. Now believers in Christ are in Christ not because we are good enough, not because we have some five-star talent, not because we could add to the team. No, sir, no, ma'am. God recruited us. God sought us. He signed us up to his team all because of his grace. Christians are in Jesus, and all the benefits now and for eternity are ours because of Jesus. We're going to get a hold of some of that today. Paul, in this verse today, declared the redemption of believers, the riches of believers, and a reminder to believers. We need to rem be reminded of that today as we come to the Lord's table. Christians are those who are redeemed, cleansed, and forgiven by the Lord. I want to challenge you. Folks today, if you don't know Jesus, to come to Jesus for salvation. Receive cleansing from Jesus through the blood of Jesus. Then rejoice in Jesus and for the saints of God to remain in Jesus. Are you in Jesus today? Is Jesus in you? That's the good question. Is Jesus in you? Have you been saved? Have you been cleansed from all your sins? Have you been forgiven by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Have you been redeemed? What do we have in Jesus? I want to get you, ask you if you're physically able to get you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word this morning, Ephesians 1, and we're just going to look at verse 7. I tried to get through verse 7, 8, 9, and 10, but I couldn't do it, so I'm going to pick up next week, Lord willing, in verse 8. <laughs> well, all I can get through this week is verse 7, but it's so good. 
So much deep stuff in verse 7. Look what it says. In verse 7, the Bible says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You may be seated as, we, as I preach together. Pre preach and you pray for me. And you listen and you respond to the Spirit of God this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you do the preaching today? Just get me out of the way, and Lord, you just preach your word today as we are reminded and challenged, Lord, about our redemption, about our, our forgiveness, Lord, through Jesus Christ and Him alone. I pray, Lord, there'd be rejoicing with your people today as we draw near to God to thank you for your grace, to thank you for your forgiveness, to thank you, Lord, for salvation full and free. We bless you today. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to look at one major verse in this verse, one major point today. Don't you notice in your outline with me that we have been saved by his sacrifice. That's what verse 7 tells us. We've been saved by Jesus' sacrifice. So Paul gives us a, a word about redemption here, and he's going to give us the details of this redemption that he talks about in verse 7. So we're going to just uh, break down verse 7 this morning. Stay right here in verse 7. Redemption. We have some benefits of being in Jesus. What are the benefits of being in Jesus? Well, we've been saved by the, his sacrifice. So notice, first of all, about the details of this redemption. Number one, we have redemption through his blood. That's a benefit of being in Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. The Bible says in verse 7, Paul gives some benefits of being in Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood. In him is a common occurrence in this passage. Paul's putting the spotlight where it's supposed to be on, on Jesus, and where it's supposed to stay on. It's to stay on Jesus. It's a key word uh, in him. It's a key word through, throughout this epistle. And by the way, without him, we're sunk. Without him, we're undone. Without him, we have no hope. Without him, we're lost and heading to hell. Without him. Whatever else you do in life, make sure you're found in him. Those who are in Jesus are those who have been redeemed by Jesus. It is in Jesus because of Jesus. It is through Jesus that we have redemption. The, look, in, look in your verse, verse 7 there again. In him we have. Paul didn't say we had. Paul didn't say you might have. He said we have. That word ha we have, is th those words are in the present tense in the Greek language. It speaks of our present reality and our present possession. We have these things already, church. <laughs> we have it. What do we have, preacher? What are you so excited about? Well, we have redemption. That word, uh, in the Greek, that word redemption means to ransom in full. It means to uh, deliverance, uh, to be set free by the payment of a ransom is what it means. The word was used to describe the freeing of a slave, uh, a prisoner of war, or a hostage. We have redemption. He said, Preacher, I've never been a slave. Hold on now, just wait a minute. I'm not through preaching. I'm going to show you you have been a slave. He said, Preacher, I've never been a prisoner of war. Hold on a minute. I'm going to show you you have been a prisoner of war. John MacArthur said this, Every human being born since the fall has come into the world enslaved to sin, under total bondage to a nature that is corrupt, evil, and separated from its creator. No person is spiritually free. No human being is free of sin or free of its consequences. The ultimate consequence of, or penalty for which is death, Romans 6, 23. Sin is man's captor and slave owner, and it demands a price for his release. Death is the price that had to be paid for man's redemption from sin. Biblical redemption, therefore, refers to the act of God by which he himself paid as a ransom the price for sin. Hallelujah. To be redeemed means for us to be bought out of the slave market of sin. We cannot purchase ourselves, and we cannot escape uh, that cruel master of sin. You can't run from it. You can't use enough ivory soap to get clean from it. You understand, we can't do it. We've been dead in our trespasses and sin. We needed the Lord Jesus to come and redeem us. I read a story this week just blessed my heart about this word redemption. A little boy named Tom carried his little boat to the edge of the river, and he carefully placed it in the water, and he slowly let out the, the string that he had tied to it. And the boat, and Tom sat on the bank there in the sunshine and admiring his little boat. And suddenly a strong current got the boat and took it away. And the string broke. 
So Tom got up and run down the sea, down the, down the shore of the river there, trying to keep up with the boat, but soon I, it just got out of sight. It, it just went away. Tom looked for that little boat for the rest of the afternoon until it got dark. Then he, discouraged and sad, he had to go home. A few days later, though, on his way home from school, Tom spotted a boat just like his in the store window. When he got closer, he saw through the window. Sure enough, it was his boat. Well, Tom hurried into to the store manager. He said, sir, that's my boat in your window. I made it. I lost it a couple days ago out on the river. That's my boat. The store manager said, sorry, son, uh, but someone else brought that boat in this morning. If you want it, you'll have to buy it for, uh, for, for one dollar. Well, Tom ran home, counted all the money he had in the world. Every penny he had, he scraped up, he had one dollar. When he reached the store, store, he rushed to the counter, and he said, here's the money for my boat. As he left the store there, he hugged his little boat. He said, now you're twice mine. First, I made you. Second, I bought you. That's redemption. You and, I, you and I, every person you see out in the world has been made by God. God's the creator. He's their creator. He made them. He made you and I. And so at Calvary's cross, he died on the cross for our sins, and he has bought us. Believers today have come to Jesus, been purchased. We're not only his by creation, we're his by salvation through redemption. In her song, we sang it earlier. I love that song. I messed it up. I picked the wrong one, by the way, so we had to change it this morning. If you saw in the bulletin, I messed that up. So I'm here confessing my faults to you this morning. But we got the right song I wanted to sing this morning. Fanny Crosby song. It says, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing that I, for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Jesus redeems him. I came across a poem this week. Listen to it. Near, so very near to God, near I could not be. For in the person of his son, I'm just as near as he. Dear, so very dear to God, dear I could not be, for in the person of his Son, I'm just as dear as he. Paul reminds the believers that they have redemption in Jesus, and he reminds them about the means of that redemption. We have redemption through the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus. He bought us out of slavery by the blood of the Lamb of God. <laughs> The blood of Jesus is the price of the payment for our sins. Jesus has brought us back from the tyranny of sin. He has ransomed us. Have you been redeemed today? Hallelujah. At a great price, he ransomed us. It cost him his life, his blood. He set us free from all sin. Those enemies that were against us, sin, pride, prejudice, hatefulness, lust, anger, legalism, all those things that have hindered us from God and kept us from God, Imagine you are a slave today, and you belong to a horrible master. Had no regard for your life, no regard for your well-being, no regard for your feelings at all. Imagine that today. And one day a benevolent stranger buys you at a staggering price and sets you free, completely free. Would you show appreciation for that, to that stranger, your liberator, the one who freed you? Would you sing his praises to anyone and everyone who would listen? <laughs> Would you willingly go back to that life, a degrading life of bondage? No. If you've been set free, you don't want to go back into slavery. Your life should reflect gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for you. Don't return to your former bondage, amen. Jesus has set us free. In him we have redemption through his blood, the Bible says. Through his blood. Now let me say this. I'm going to clarify what I'm saying, but I'm here to tell you we are not saved by the miracles of Jesus. We are not saved by the messages of Jesus. Jesus walked on the water, calmed the storms, raised the dead. He's got all power in heaven and on earth. When he preached, there was none that preached like him. He spoke with authority. We're not saved by the messages of Jesus. We're not saved by the ministry of Jesus. The ministry he did in Galilee didn't save us. Now, they, all of those things, we never minimize those things. Man, I love the miracles of Jesus. I thank God for the message of Jesus. Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon that's ever preached. But I, I'm telling you, uh, we're not saved by the miracles or the message or the ministry. 
of Jesus. We don't minimize those things. Those things validated him as the Messiah. It shouted loudly and clearly, I am God the Son that came in the flesh. I'm Emmanuel, God with you. They, they shouted those things. But it wasn't those things that saved us. I'm here to tell you today that we are saved by the sacrifice of our Savior. Now, he's the one and only one that could do that because he's the sinless Son of God. <laughs> So when he went to the cross, he went not for his sin. He didn't pay for his sin. He paid for my sin and your sin and the world's sin. He died on the cross for us. Hallelujah. In his book, Unfinished Business, Charles Sell, I put this on the screen. Charles Sell said this, If our greatest need had been an information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. Lord knows we've got too many of them already. Amen. I threw that in for no charge. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. If you've not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, let me tell you as kindly as, kindly as I could tell you today, if you've not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you've not been redeemed. You say, I'm working, I'm trying, preacher, you, 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 you're wasting your time. You say, I'm doing the best I can. You're wasting your time. Your best is not good enough. Will not be, never will be good enough. You can't make it on your, you need to be redeemed, set free. Lord Jesus gave his life, shed his blood, died for our sins. And we must come to him, believe on him, trust in him, receive him, and be born again. Paul reminds the Christians about the benefits of being in Jesus. I mean, this is a great benefit, brother, uh, brothers and sisters. This is a great benefit. Number one, we have redemption through his blood. Number two, it's, this is a good, great benefit too. Man, uh, one better than the other. It goes all together. Number two, won't you see, the second great benefit we have is the removal of our sins. We have redemption through his blood. Notice in your outline, we have removal of our sins. The Bible says in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Believers have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God, and believers have been forgiven of all their sins by God. We have redemption through his blood. We have removal of our sins. The word forgiveness there means freedom, deliverance, uh, to be remitted, uh, to send away, to pardon. Thank God he's pardoned us. We have a forgiving, loving God. There are no greater benefits now or forever than salvation, full and free. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus takes our sins away, cleanses us, and forgives us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We are redeemed fully. The price was paid in full. I don't know how, if you've ever paid off your house note, a car note. Me and Tracy just got through paying off her vehicle and my vehicle. And I said, man, that's, that, those, they're, they're ours. <laughs> And we were just using them for a while. Now they belong to us, all the faults and all. But it feels good to pay off something, don't it? Get out of, out of debt. Can I tell you there's no greater debt? We couldn't pay it, but Jesus paid it for us. <laughs> Jesus paid our sin debt. First John 1, 7, the Bible says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you see that there? The blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse us from most sin. He doesn't cleanse us just from the bad, bad sins. He doesn't cleanse us from all the past sins. The Bible says he cleanses us from all sin. The Lord forgives us and cleanses us from all of our sin. Hallelujah. Psalm 103. The Bible says this. I put this on the screen. Verse 10 through 12. Listen to this. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, he says, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. They're gone. Never to return back to us. Let that truth today sink deep into your heart and rejoice in God's grace. In Jesus, we have full redemption and complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Lehman Strauss said this in his commentary. I'll put this on the screen. You can read it with me. He said, a man may forgive a friend who has wronged him, but the forgiveness cannot cancel the guilt. But when God forgives a sinner, he actually remits the sin and removes the guilt. Forgiveness for the believing sinner is an act of God whereby he sets aside absolutely and eternally by judicial decree all condemnation and guilt. 
judicial forgiveness in, in contra contradistinction to the father's forgiveness of sin and of his sin and child covers all sin and by it the believing sinner is pardoned forever it forever absolves it forever absolves and acquits the sinner but forgiveness was dear to the forgiver it cost the life of God's son we have forgiveness of our sins hallelujah the word sin there by the way means a fallen by the wayside and you and I have fallen by the wayside. We all have, haven't we? I mean, we've missed the mark. We have, mess, we have messed up. We have broken God's law. We have spurned His grace. We have rejected His commandments. We have done wicked in His sight. All of us have. We have all been condemned as lawbreakers and enslaved to sin. And we all need forgiveness from God and the mercy of God. And in Jesus, we have redemption and removal of all our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. There are no second-class Christians. Do you hear me today? Uh, there are no citizens of God's kingdom. Second class. Every sin of every believer is forgiven forever. Old York Stott in his commentary on uh, Ephesians said this, There is a price to be paid for breaking the law of God. It is infinite punishment. We have broken the law, and justice demands that we pay the price. But the Savior has come and done what we could never do. The infinite God-man has paid the infinite price. He has completely paid it. There is nothing left for us to pay. We have no debt. We are free. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. The church should always resound with praise and abound with praise because we've been saved by the grace of God. And what we have in Jesus, the Bible tells us we have redemption through his blood. Secondly, we have removal of our sins. Then thirdly, don't you notice we have the riches of his grace. If you're taking notes with me, look at it in verse 7. He says, according to the riches of his grace. According. In verse 7, Paul adds that we have riches of his grace. So in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. If that's not good enough, hallelujah, that ought to be great. I praise the Lord, brother Ray. Amen. We have not only redemption, we have removal of our sins. Then thirdly, we have riches of his grace. The Bible says according. Now that's an interesting word and a descriptive word of how God gave. People can give according to their riches or out of or from their riches. And there's a big difference there. Uh, people can give according or from. If you've, ever, if you've ever heard somebody say, boy, if I was rich, I'd be giving a lot more. That's not necessarily so. Uh, matter of fact, Ron Blue in his book, Storm Shelter, said this. Uh, uh, he gives some stats that people with higher incomes give away smaller percentages of their wealth. L listen, now, matter of fact, I put these on the screen so you can track with me. He said if somebody makes uh, under $10,000 a year, they give 3.6% of their income. If they, make, if they fall in this bracket, $10,000 to $19,999, they, they give away 3.4% of their income. If they're in the $20,000 to $29,999 bracket, they give away 2.5% of their income. If they're in the thirty to $39,999, it drops down to 1.8%. That's a stingy bunch there, ain't it? Then if they make $40,000 to $49,999, they give 2.3% of their income. Then it jumps up some to 50000 If uh, they fall in that bracket, 50000 to $74,999, they give 2% of their income. 75000 to $99,999, they give away 1.9% of their income. And according to Ron Blue, if they make over $100,000 a year, they give 2.5% of their income. What does that mean, preacher? Well, it means most people do not give to the Lord as they should give, nor do they give like the Lord. The Lord doesn't give from his riches, but according to his riches. It is by the riches of God's grace that God sent his Son into the world, and the Son came and gave himself for the world. Jesus gave it all. He paid it all, but he gave it all. He gave his life blood. He gave his life for us, a sinless sacrifice, a perfect redemption. He gave it all. Hallelujah, church. Paul referred to God's riches, listen to this, six times in this letter. The word riches there is a Greek word plutos. It means wealth or fullness, abundance. It means a valuable bestowment. There's no greater bestowment give it, get bestowed upon us is the riches of God's grace and his son. The salvation that he gave us. Not only was this grace given, it was lavished on us, generously showered on us. God wants to give people grace. And when he gives, he gives it abundant, extravagantly. 
His grace is greater than all my sin. And let me say, as your preacher this morning, His grace is greater than all your sin as well. Hallelujah. Thank God for His grace. We have in Christ Jesus the riches of God's grace lavished upon us in the free gift of salvation bought and purchased by Jesus Christ through His sacrificial death and the shedding of His blood on the cross of Calvary. It is through His blood that we are redeemed and through His blood that we have received forgiveness of all of our sin. Hey, remember it like this. Salvation is free, but it is not cheap. It costs the Son of God, his life, to pay sin's debt. So according to the riches of his grace, we are saved, set free, and secured in Jesus. Thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ because without him, we would be sunk. Without him, we'd be lost. I love what Mylon LeFerber wrote in his song, Without Him. It came to mind when I was writing this sermon this week, so I want to put it in the sermon for you. Listen to this. Mylon LeFerber wrote, Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. The word grace, he said, by the riches of his grace. You know that word, you've heard it, karos? It means uh, gratitude, benefit, accept to be acceptable, the favor of God. So grace is a main theme in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and this word will appear again and again in this epistle. It's God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor in which he freely given uh, abundantly through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.20, I put this on the screen. Paul wrote, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Thank God for his grace. In his poem, My Name is Written There, William Blaine. Listen to these words. He said, Though humble and obscure below, my name is there in heaven I know. Tis written by the hand of God, tis written with the Savior's blood. Twas there before the night, day and night, in beams of God's unerring light. By Jesus' blood, t'was crimson dyed when he for me was crucified. Who would erase it from that page, unspoiled by sin, undimmed by age? Must Calvary's mark from him efface and change eternal truth and grace? Tis there by Jesus' worth alone, for worth of credit have I none, and nothing less than sin in him can ever that inscription dim. Tis ever there, O oh, sweet the thought, the space it fills by blood was bought. Tis there by grace, tis there by night, right, unsullied in the Father's sight. Though I, though I such love so feebly serve, and daily worse than death deserve, O oh, oath by blood, by priestly care, my worthless name he keepeth there. Let such as know no second birth labor to write their name on earth. My joy is this, that love divine on heaven's scroll hath written mine. Name's been written there, Brother Ray. Hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because of Jesus. Because I'm in Jesus. And because Jesus is in me. Have you been redeemed today? Is your name written there? Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm not asking you, are you a Baptist? I know you're a Baptist. You go to a Baptist church. I know that. I'm not asking you all those things. I'm asking you, have you been born again? Have you truly been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in His blood? Do you have the forgiveness of your sins? Have you received the riches of His grace? As we come to the Lord's table, symbolically, we don't have a table here, and those elements we're going to partake of today are symbolic. Uh, symbolic of the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. We come in remembrance of what he did for us. So, Christian, the Lord suffers for believers, but it's also for believers that have confessed and repented. Make sure there's nothing hindering our fellowship with Jesus. Make sure you get this thing right before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. If you've not been redeemed, the Lord's Supper is not for you, but I'm telling you, redemption is for you. <laughs> if you're not redeemed, I want to introduce you today to the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins, who was buried, and on the third day, God raised him again. He lives today, and he wants to come and live in you. He's ascended to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the throne of God, where he makes intercession for his saints. He's coming again one day to receive his church and then rule the world. Trust in him today. Turn to him today from your sins. Be saved by the grace of God. You can receive 
vast riches, eternal riches in Jesus today. Hey, are you in Jesus? Let us remember his sacrifice. Rejoice in his salvation. Let us be renewed in our minds, revived in our souls. Let us be restored to fellowship today. Well, so here's the invitation. Brother Ray's going to come and lead us. Miss Jessica's going to come and lead us in a song in just a moment uh, as we come to the Lord's table. Uh, here's the invitation. Respond today in faith. Trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you need to be redeemed, confess that to Jesus today. Be saved today. He loves you. He wants to save you. Maybe you're walking at a guilty distance. They say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I just need to be restored. He's in the restoration business. He'll restore you today. If you're wayward, if, you, if you're walking at a guilty distance, you're not walking by faith, or you're lacking in faithfulness to God, He'll renew you today. Some of you may need renewed in your faith today. Some of you may need to come and confess and repent today. Need repentance is the invitation. Repentance is a good word. It calls us to come back to Jesus. He allows U-turns. Amen. We, get all, we fall by the wayside sometime. We need to repent. Then maybe during this invitation, believer, you just need to rejoice in the God of your salvation because we have redemption through his blood. We have removal of our sins. We have the riches of his grace. Rejoice in Jesus and for Jesus today. Father, in the name of Jesus today, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come to the Lord's table. Uh, to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid it all on Calvary's cross. Lord, we can't work our way to heaven. We don't deserve to go to heaven. It's all because of the riches of your grace. Lord, thank you for redemption. God, thank you for redeeming my doomed and damned soul. 24 years ago, Lord, when I was 24 years old, you saved me, and I thank you and praise you today for that. Rejoice in you today. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sin. Lord, we just praise you for forgiveness. And Lord, as we come to your table to remember your sacrifice today, I pray we'd worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us respond in this invitation time to get things right with you. Lord, if there's any in this place that need to be redeemed, we would rejoice with them today that they can come to the Lord's table as a saved, saved sinner, transformed, and going to heaven because of the grace of God. Lord, I pray for that today. Lord, I pray you would work in hearts and lives in this invitation time. And do a work as only you can work, Lord. And we give you praise. We thank you that believers are in Jesus. And we thank you for our Lord, Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.